Although as uh, professionals within the criminal justice system, we cannot truly empathize with a victim of domestic violence, but we certainly are well aware of the risk factors that go along with being a victim of domestic violence. We're aware of the statistics uh, that happen when victims of crime don't come forward. So the fact that these victims are right now watching this video is an excellent step to show that they've taken a step, stood up for themselves, and said enough. And the police are now involved and the process is involved. Certainly through parts of this process, it will feel to victims of uh, domestic violence that we're interfering too much in their lives. They're no longer able to speak to their husband or wife or partner. Um, we're saying to them, you must stay away, and these are the terms that he has to obey. And sometimes, unfortunately, it feels like the victim of domestic violence is being re-victimized or uh, burdened with these terms of release that should really only be um, affecting the person accused of committing violence. But these are necessary, and they're done solely for the safety of the victim in mind. A court case can be a very lengthy ordeal for a victim of crime. And what might seem normal to the lawyers involved in the process can seem like a lifetime for a victim of uh, domestic abuse. Sometimes, if the accused person is willing to plead guilty at the earliest available opportunity because he or she has great remorse, wants to move on, and wants to reconnect with his or her family, then a guilty plea could be entered on uh, within a week or two of the charges being laid. It is possible that can be done, but that it's definitely the exception. Even if a person intends to ultimately plead guilty, it can often be a month or two for meetings to occur between defense counsel and the Crown for uh, us to meet with the victim, and just for available court time, depending on the issues of a particular case. If it's going through to trial, it's not unusual that the trial occurs even one year after the offenses or longer. It, it is possible that it, it takes that long to work its way through the system. I believe the justice system let me down. I believe that instead of holding someone accountable for what he did, he was allowed to say, I didn't mean to be a bad boy, and I'm really sorry. And maybe he is sorry. I, you know, I don't know, and, and I, I don't need to know at this point. Those who administer our laws, including law officers, crown attorneys, judges, and others, may deal every day with the most brutal crimes. In some way, they have the need to build self-protective barriers, which may come across to victims as insensitivity. To help you through this ordeal, seek out supportive friends, counsellors, or advocates. When anybody reports a crime uh, or a call for service, an officer, most of the time a uniform officer, will attend the scene immediately. They're going to assess that scene, assess the victim, provide emergency response if it's required, uh, they may seize the scene, they may hold the scene. You often see the police tape go up. Uh, that's to secure the evidence. Uh, probably immediately after that, you're going to uh, start to see supervisors show up on the scene as police resources are being driven uh, to assist that victim and also to secure the crime scene. We have many levels of expertise. We may have uh, forensic identification officers or scenes of crime officers arrive on scene to start collecting the evidence. The police detective is going to show up on scene and initially drive that investigation. When dealing with domestic violence calls, the police officer's role differs a little. When a call comes in for domestic violence, it's obviously, from the police standpoint, it's a two-officer call. You'll never get a, a single officer attending a domestic violence call. Uh, officer safety and victim safety is paramount. We will try and get as much information prior to the call as possible. Upon arriving to the scene, hopefully the officers have any type of history that's involved in previous domestic violence situations at that at that residence or location. Upon arriving, uh, because domestic violence are very fueled with emotion and a history of emotion, um, generally it will be to calm down 
the situation, uh, ascertain who called or why they called, uh, separate all parties, and then investigate. It's not always apparent at first sight who the dominant aggressor is, and it's the officer's job to investigate to find out who the dominant aggressor is and if charges are warranted, if there's reasonable and probable grounds to lay those charges, the dominant aggressor will be charged. So it's not always the person that maybe has the visible injury that's the victim. And it's the officer's job to ascertain and investigate that. Interviews will be taken, pictures will be taken, and then they'll proceed with charges if they're warranted. Other experiences a police officer might face are those of frustration and confusion. Victims may also resist the officer's efforts. They may not always provide the information required to make an arrest. Victims may minimize the violence experience. Police officers take domestic calls very seriously because they are highly charged emotional situations, which can be dangerous to everyone involved. The officer has a responsibility under the Victim's Bill of Rights to follow up with the victim to let them know about any type of release conditions that an offender may be on, to encourage the victim to report breaches of those release documents, to work with the police department instead of against the police department so we can assist them in the best way, and to encourage them to ask for help and get the resources that are out there available for them, the counseling, the victim safety planning, support link, anything that we think they may need that's the officer's responsibility to look after the victim. It's important for police to refer victims to victim services and the other affiliated programs to ensure that victims are connected with community partners that can best see them through a process that can be extremely difficult if they're isolated or on their own. Police have a specific role in dealing with victims of crime and working often with the offender and putting them into a process in the system. Having police connect victims with community partners that can support them is probably similar to a comparison like um, if an offender is arrested, they immediately go to, I want to speak to my lawyer. I mean, the ideal world would be victims being aware of victim services and those kind of agencies that they, a victim can quickly say, I want victim services or someone to support me. Domestic violence is a situation where um, a lot of times the victims don't speak out and they keep it within the four walls of their home. Yet people around them, family and friends and employers and teachers and doctors, they recognize something's going on. And as a community, to support that person, they can report the incident to police. If they report the incident to police, we will investigate it in domestic-related investigations where criminal offenses occurred, we are obligated to lay a charge. But we still have to have the grounds to lay that charge, okay? So it's not automatic. We still have to have those grounds to lay that charge. Uh, and the victim, it takes the pressure off the victim to say, well, I don't want to lay charges or I'm scared to lay charges, is we may have a case where it's another witness that saw the husband or the wife uh, hurt the victim or assault the victim or threaten the victim, in which case the victim may come to us and say, I don't want to say anything, I want to stay out of this. Well, that's fine, but we still have a witness that saw what happened and that's my witness to prove that that offense is committed. One role for which a victim of crime is responsible is in giving a statement to the police. The following information concerns the procedure regarding giving a statement also known as a KGB statement. A KGB statement is a special type of statement that we do. It's a videotape statement that's taken under oath. So when we bring in a, a victim and want to perform a KGB statement, we will bring them into a video interview room. I interview or introduce myself uh, and explain to the person what is about to happen. It is very unnerving for any victim to sit and have a KGB statement done because there are three pieces of paper that I use in performing it. And I'm going to explain to you that you need to give your statement under oath or solemn affirmation. I'm going to explain to the person how important it is to tell the truth. 
I'm going to explain to the person three different cr uh, criminal offenses that they could possibly commit while giving the statement. Things like obstruct justice, public mischief, lying to the police, perjury. That scares the victim. And I certainly understand why it does. A KGB statement may be an unpleasant experience for victims, but police would like victims to be aware that the statement also has many benefits to the victim of crime. So a video statement also assists the victim. When we go to court, in some circumstances, the Crown can play that video statement and have the victim uh, acknowledge and accept the contents of the video statement and agree that they are true. That allows the court to see exactly how the victim was reacting, how the effects of the assault uh, were affecting that victim that night, uh, six, nine months ago from the day that we're in court. Another responsibility a victim has in crime investigations is in providing up-to-date and accurate information to the police and working with them to ensure their own safety. It's helpful for the police if the victim is honest with us and divulges all the information that they know. The police have a lot of assets that we can give to the victim, a lot of things we can do for the victim if we know fully what has happened. In defining a high-risk offender, uh, there's many things to consider. Um, uh, there's the fact that um, the nature of the offense that's been committed, um, the propensity of the person to reoffend, um, any record that they have. Uh, the perception of the victim is very important. You know, what does the victim feel about the threat that that person poses to them? Uh, other circumstances to consider, such as whether or not there are drug abusers, alcohol abusers, you know, whether there's um, um, access to firearms. Uh, so. I don't think there's, in my opinion anyway, there's really a, a, a firm definition of a high-risk offender. Rather, it's more taking into context all those things that give rise to why that person may be a high risk. High-risk offenders would be identified through a few different means. One would be looking at their past criminal record. So we would check to see the severity, the increasing pattern of violent offenses, or if they have um, similar types of offenses that they're now before the courts with. So especially in a domestic violence process, if somebody has increasing violence in their history, when it comes to domestic violence, we as the Crowns would be red flagged ourselves that this could be a potential high-risk offender. The high-risk offender on the other end could also be the person being released from a um, penitentiary after serving a sentence that high-risk offender is immediately going to be released by the correction staff. Uh, while in custody, serving his, his time or her time, they would undergo a number of different assessments, and the, those assessments will reflect whether or not they still pose a risk to the community when they're released. If they have a high risk of recidivism to repeat the crime, then the police are notified. Once a high-risk offender has been identified, police as well as probation and parole will handle the specific case more intensively when the offender is released into the community. I think the difference in dealing with high-risk offenders than other offenders is that the reporting is more frequent during the supervision period. The referrals are prompt to address their programming needs. There's strict and immediate enforcement and frequent communication with other criminal justice partners like police, the Crown's Office, Victim Services, and other agencies. Additionally, we have more contact with the victim. Because the concerns of victims of high-risk offenders may be greater, the approach taken is much more involved on all levels. This includes such things as notification, reviewing safety plans, considering more intensive counselling, and offering such services as the Support Link program, which is very useful upon the offender's release. When my ex-husband was released from jail, I knew his release date. Uh, prior to that date, I went to the local police in the town that I was living in and said, my ex-husband's going to be re released from jail and here is our history. They had made the appointment, I, I had made an appointment with them, so they were able to get that history off their system. And what they did on his release day 
was they had for about 72 hours around where we lived, we had patrols. Uh, it was, I felt very safe. The, the victims of a high-risk offender are going to be in pretty much constant contact with the police. They're going to be aware of the investigation that the police are doing about that offender being released back into the community. They should be kept uh, apprised of where that offender is going to be living, where they may be working, where they may be traveling to and from, who they should be hanging around with and who they shouldn't be hanging around with. That way the victim can still identify to us uh, whether some of these people or places that they're going are appropriate. Risk assessment should be conducted in all crimes involving personal injury or threat. Risk assessments are conducted to understand what kinds of threatening and violent behaviours an offender has committed and may have the potential to commit again. A police officer or probation and parole officer may ask you a number of questions while conducting a risk assessment. Risk assessments may be conducted frequently. The level of risk of reoffending may change as circumstances change. If the person who has committed the crime is in jail, there is a lower level of risk of danger to a victim at that time. The risk of harm may increase when the offender is released into the community. The risk assessment is going to be undertaken on a multidiscipline level. The police will likely head that uh, investigation. We will seek input from uh, victim service groups, the victim himself or herself. We will seek input from uh, probation and parole, the corrections uh, institution uh, where this offender had last been. We will seek out doctors, psychologists, sociologists, anybody with expertise in the field that we are investigating, all for the hope of trying to understand this offender that's coming back into the community. Ask a police officer to go over the results of the risk assessment with you because often victims may not be aware of the danger they are in. This will give you both an opportunity to discuss the severity of the situation and provide better information for safety planning. The Crown Attorney in general were the prosecutors of crime. So a file, once the charge has been laid by the police, comes across our desk and we have to screen it. So we have to look to the file to see, is there a reasonable prospect of conviction? And is it in the public interest to continue the prosecution uh, of this individual? The first stage is often a bail hearing stage. So another Crown, or the same Crown, We'll look at the file to decide, is this an individual that can be let out on agreed upon terms with defense counsel and crown counsel to let this person go without having a bail hearing? Or are our concerns high enough that we have to have a bail hearing for this individual? After the bail hearing stage, uh, whether or not an accused person is detained in custody, we now, um, as the crown, look to this case to see, is it going to be resolved? So will there be a guilty plea in some form of uh, sentencing that's agreed upon between defense and crown? Or is this going to trial? Because uh, that's the only two ways that a charge will go through the criminal justice system if we're not withdrawing it. And the crown's role is to uh, guide that uh, file and that charge throughout that system to its resolution, whether it be ultimately the guilty plea or the trial. When there is a domestic uh, violence charge before the court, the day that the accused is arrested and then being brought before, uh, before a bail court, that victim of the domestic violence will be contacted um, by a social worker from the Victim Witness Assistance Program. What we are doing in that situation is really trying to meet with uh, victims of domestic violence right after the incident occurred so that they have an opportunity to meet with us and find out what's going on, how to get referrals to the community. Um, we discuss safety planning and refer them to other um, agencies in the community to look at safety planning. It gives us an opportunity to tell them about our program and so they feel supported and have an understanding of what's happening. Um, this way they can also give information to the Crown so that the Crown can have um, solid information to make good recommendations at the bail hearing. 
The primary focus of the Bail Safety Project is to gather information at the bail stage that can contribute to the safety of victims. The program acknowledges that the victim is the one who holds information about the history of the relationship and its potential lethality. What can we do at this stage of the process to ensure that the victim is as safe as possible, uh, knowing that the likelihood is quite high that the accused person charged of these offences against this victim will get out of custody? We need to know from that victim at the very earliest stage possible what terms could be put in place to keep her or him as safe as they can be. And those terms get into very specifics, uh, child access. Should this be allowed? And sometimes not. If a, if a child is a direct witness to a crime, um, it could be appropriate that we say that the 13-year-old daughter, even the daughter of the accused, is, uh, cannot be contacted directly or indirectly by the accused? Or is the safety concerns more because mom doesn't want to see dad, the accused, because there's a direct face-to-face -face contact if he's picking up the children? So maybe it's a third party or a family member that can assist in dropping off the kids back and forth. The information gathered allows the Crown to tailor bail recommendations to the individual accused. If the accused is released, Crown Counsel can seek conditions based on this information that contribute to the safety of the victim. Crown Counsel will often seek conditions of release that include prohibiting the accused from attending the victim's residence, place of work, place of recreation, place of worship, or homes of the victim's family. In a domestic violence court program, teams of specialized personnel, including police, Crown Attorney, Victim Witness Assistance Program staff, probation services, partner assault response program staff, and community agencies work together to ensure priority is given to the safety and needs of domestic assault victims and their children. There's a specific team of Crown Attorneys that deal with domestic violence offenses, and there's four of us in this team. Um, however, a victim of domestic violence may encounter each of us if they just so happen to get us on different days and they need to come into the office for many times in meeting. Um, and then once it reaches trial, it's possible that yet a different Crown is in court. So if, if a case of, uh, if there is a serious violent offense, whether it be domestic violence or otherwise, and there's serious victim uh, concerns with the Crown's office, we assign one Crown to deal with the file throughout the process. But that can't be done for all um, charges for obvious reasons. We just don't have the scheduling ability to make sure that one Crown deals with one file from its beginning to its conclusion. But if it is a serious case, if it does involve ch child witnesses, um, if the charges are serious enough, then one crown will be assigned to a file and we do our best to make sure that one crown stays, meets with the victim and sees it through to its conclusion. Witnesses and victims may have fears and concerns about testifying in court. They may be worried about giving personal information. They may be unsure about understanding and answering questions well. They may be worried about not remembering important dates, times, or other details. These concerns are normal. The Crown Attorney and Victims Witness Assistance Program can provide witnesses and victims with information about what to expect in court and options that may make testifying easier. We will meet with the witnesses or the victims of these matters and prepare them for testifying at trial. What is it like to give evidence in chief to a Crown Attorney? What types of questions are the Crown Attorney allowed? What are we allowed to ask them? What are we not allowed to ask them? Um, and then in cross-examination, which often leads to the highest level of anxiety for victims and witnesses of crime, uh, what types of questions can the defense lawyer ask them when they're on uh, on the witness stand at trial. So we try to prepare them for that, what it's like, uh, example questions, and what they can expect. 
A victim impact statement is a written statement that describes the harm or loss suffered by the victim and the effect of the crime on the victim. The Criminal Code requires the court to consider a victim impact statement, if there is one, at the time of sentencing an offender. A person who has suffered harm or physical or emotional loss as a result of the offence can prepare a victim impact statement, as can survivors of a deceased victim. A victim impact statement is a real powerful tool for your voice to be heard. And you can read it yourself or it can be read into um, testimony for you by the Crown Attorney. And it, it's, it's very powerful to state where you're at and how it has affected you. The Victim Witness Assistance Program, or Victim Services Middlesex County, can help victims prepare a statement. If you would like assistance, contact information will be provided in the services section of this DVD resource. The Ontario Parole and Earned Release Board decides whether or not to grant parole to adult offenders who have sentences of fewer than two years. The National Parole Board handles offenders who have sentences of two years or more. The decision to grant or deny parole to an offender is made by two members of the board. Members carefully review all of the information on the offender's file and conduct an in-person interview with the offender at a parole hearing. Victims may provide a written submission or attend the offender's parole hearing and give an oral statement. Victims may also provide information to a board case officer who will ensure the board members have the information before making a decision. Because this information is used in deciding whether the offender will be granted early release, the offender may have access to any information provided by victims and will be present if an oral statement is given at a hearing. I had the right as a victim to attend his early release hearing and speak directly with the parole board members. I did that. I went and the information they gave me is one, they were exceptionally happy to, to meet with me and they were very impressed at my courage and they wanted me to know at that point, and this is going back eight years ago, that Typically, when they saw a woman come before them, she was there to plead for release of her husband who was incarcerated because she needed him to be at home to help her with her family. And I said, I don't need him to be at home. I need him to be accountable. The parole board is interested in knowing about the physical, financial, and emotional impact of the offense on the victim, the ongoing impact, and any conditions the victim would like the board to impose if the offender is granted release. I didn't feel when he had imposed a lifelong disability on me that he should be let out early. We had not been in any counseling. My kids were having nightmares. I was having nightmares. I felt that what sentence had he served at that point as far as retribution to us? That the only way he was going to give us retribution was to pay society a price. That's what our justice system says. And they, they I think I spent maybe 15 minutes with them, and I don't know how long they spent speaking to him, but it was a very, um, very detailed decision that they made, and the detail was, no early release. And that was all the detail that I needed. And they said that me going and speaking to them had a very large impact on their decision. Victims who wish to attend or participate in hearings must contact a board case officer as soon as possible after receiving notification and request authorization to attend the hearing. All hearings will be held in provincial correctional facilities and victims or observers will have to go through security screening prior to being granted permission to attend the hearing. The Ontario government has created a fund to provide victims with some financial assistance to attend parole hearings in Ontario. For information related to the fund or to speak to someone about Ontario Parole and Earned Release Board's policy concerning victims, contact the board case officer. On your screen, you will find the contact information for the location nearest you. Victims are able to receive information about the offender while in prison in a federal 
correction facility or on probation with the National Parole Board of Canada if they so desire. Write to the National Parole Board Regional Office serving the area where the offender is imprisoned or under supervision. Any regional office may be contacted to find out where to direct the request. Use the Request for Registry of Decisions form available on the National Parole Board website at www.npb-cnlc.gc.ca. For more information, contact the National Parole Board office nearest you. Please note the contact information on your screen. I supervise offenders in the community um, on probation orders um, that are supervised on parole certificates or that are bound by conditional sentence orders, otherwise called to house arrest. Um, the offenders uh, report to me in person on a regular basis and my role is to ensure their compliance with court orders. So my role essentially is completing an assessment with the offender when I first meet them and that assessment process is ongoing and takes a period of time to, um, to gather. This allows me to make the appropriate referrals for the offender to attend in-house programming, um, rehabilitative programming, and any other programming that the probation order or um, conditional sentence order or parole certificate mandates. A probation and parole officer's enforcement role deals with the following. If the offender is non-compliant with the court order, my role is enforcement. So that might take place through a verbal caution, a written caution, or a breach of probation charge, which means the offender returns to court. Probation and parole officers also work very closely with the victim and encourage victims to stay in close contact with them as well, especially if they have concerns. If I'm completing a pre-sentence report for the courts, I'm going to contact the victim by telephone and generally that telephone conversation consists of me learning about the information that the victim has to provide me for the courts. It might include things like the relationship the victim has had with the offender if in fact there has been a relationship. It might also allow the victim to have some input into the court report that I'm writing. After the offender has been placed on a period of probation or sentenced in court, my involvement with the victim is ongoing and intermittent. Um, my first contact with the victim is to explain the probation order to the victim if, in fact, there are conditions that refer directly to the victim, such as a non-association condition. You know, he has conditions and they are to not be uh, on my property, to not contact me directly or indirectly, and uh, when I found out through one of my children that he was driving by our house, it was a call to probation and said, one of my kids says he's driving by and um, I'm not comfortable with that. I mean, I, I don't live on his traveled path and, and he, he, that was addressed with him. 